this video we will talk about the different ways that molecular ecologists use to actually quantify genetic diversity. So what are some of the different ways to actually estimate what genetic diversity is in a population? And we'll talk about three main ways to do this based on either alleles, on heterozygosity, and based on sequence divergence. So in this video, we'll cover each of the particular methods related to those general categories. So first, let's start with alleles. Allelic diversity, which is often abbreviated just as a capital letter A, is the average number of alleles per locus. So just as an example, if we had one locus that had four alleles and another locus, so second, that had six alleles, our allelic diversity would just be the average of those. So our allelic diversity would be five. Again, we don't really need to know the details of this, just is just for you to understand roughly how these calculations are performed. So allelic diversity is the average number of alleles per locus. And importantly, allelic diversity is really sensitive to sample size. So if we think about this example here again with the corn, the number of alleles that we recognize in the population can be dependent on which individuals we sample. So again, if we're only sampling some of these individuals, we're not going to recognize all of the alleles that are present at that actual locus. So allelic diversity is heavily influenced by how well you actually sample, by how big your sample size is. If you do want to use alleles to estimate genetic diversity, a better way to do that is to use this metric called allelic richness, or A sub R. This is more appropriate for calculating genetic diversity based on allele numbers, and we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, okay, and specifically why is, like I said, it is more appropriate because it controls for different sample sizes, and it actually does that through something we've talked about previously through this process of rarefaction. So this is used commonly in ecology where you're looking at species richness for different samples. And what this method is essentially doing is correcting for bias that can creep in as a result of uneven sample sizes. So if you're trying to compare two different populations, for instance. So if we had one sample that had 200 individuals and we identified 15 alleles and we had another sample of only 50 individuals that circle's supposed to be smaller and from that we identified 8 alleles what this rarefaction allelic richness would do is basically do computation analysis to figure out, okay, if this 200 individual sample, really we only had 50 individuals, how many alleles would we identify? So it's basically a way for us to figure out if this sample here identified more alleles just because we sampled more individuals or if because there actually is a difference there. So of the two options for calculating genetic diversity based on alleles, Allelic richness is the more appropriate way because it can account for differences in sample sizes. Okay, the other way that we talked about, the second category that you can use to calculate allelic, excuse me, that you can calculate genetic diversity is using heterozygosity. And the first one we'll talk about is observed heterozygosity, often abbreviated as H. Uh, underscore or subletter O <laughs> grown and observed heterozygosity tells us what proportion of individuals within a population are heterozygous at a particular locus. So this 
is an image of a scarlet tiger moth that is shown in table 5.1 in your book. And what they did is calculate the number of heterozygous individuals And for observed heterozygosity, what you do is just divide that by the total number of individuals. And in this case, for this particular example, they found in the scarlet tiger moths that the observed heterozygosity is 0.085. So because of the way that observed heterozygosity is calculated, where you're identifying heterozygous individuals out of the total number of individuals, it's really sensitive to sample size. So again, the number of heterozygous individuals that you identify is going to be partially dependent on how well you sample that population. So observed heterozygosity, it's important to keep in mind, is influenced by how well you sample. A better alternative that is less sensitive to sample size is the metric of gene diversity, often abbreviated as a lowercase h, and for our purposes, if you see the term expected heterozygosity or H subletter E, it's the same thing as gene diversity. So those two things are indicating the same metric. And what gene diversity tells you is the frequency of heterozygotes that would be expected if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So using those equations where you can take allele frequencies and then calculate genotype frequencies from that, that is what this gene diversity metric can tell you. And again, importantly, this is less sensitive to sampling size. So if you were given an option for heterozygosity metrics, this expected heterozygosity or gene diversity is better than observed heterozygosity because it's not sensitive to the sampling size differences. And how do you calculate gene diversity? The only data that you need to input into the program, for instance, if you're calculating this, is allele frequencies. So this is an example of what some of those allele frequencies might look like. This is from mosquito populations on different islands in Hawaii. Um, here's the citation down here. So when we look at these types of allele frequency data, on the far left here, we have the different microsatellite alleles in base pairs. Remember, the microsatellite is different numbers of repeats of these sequences of bases. So the different alleles are the different lengths, or the different number of repeats. So we have four different alleles that are slightly different lengths. And then on the right two columns here, we have the allele frequencies for each of those alleles for two different populations, for Midway and Kauai. And like I said, I'm not going to cover specifically how to calculate gene diversity for our purposes, but just looking at this data, which population intuitively do you think would have higher heterozygosity and why? Higher gene diversity and why? So if we look here, on the left we have our midway population. This population only has three alleles. They don't actually have this 212 allele at all. For the population here on the right, for Kauai, they have all four alleles present. And if you look at the distributions of the frequencies, it's more even over here in Kauai. So on the left, for the midway population, they only have three alleles. And of those three alleles they do have, this 224 allele has over half of the frequency. So it's not very common to have these other less frequent alleles. And so in fact, when you do the calculations, the expected heterozygosity, or again, that's equivalent to gene diversity, is 0.595 for the midway population. And for Kauai, that expected heterozygosity is 0.68. And so if I were just to look at this data, even without calculating, that intuitively makes sense to me because the Kauai population has more alleles and the frequency is more spread out amongst those four different alleles.
Okay, and then the last method, if we are looking specifically at haploid mitochondrial data, for instance, we cannot use that heterozygosity based metric we just talked about because with mitochondria, they're uniparentally inherited, so you only get them from your mom. So there really is only one haplotype. We can't have heterozygotes because you're only getting one allele from your mom. So if you want to calculate genetic diversity for haploid mitochondrial data, what you can do instead is use this metric called nucleotide diversity that is often abbreviated as the symbol pi. And what this does is directly quantify the mean divergence between sequences. And again, you don't need to know how to actually calculate this by hand per se, but it is good to know that one of the programs we've used previously in lab, that PopArt that we actually used, one of the options within PopArt, once you have your data entered in, is to calculate nucleotide diversity. So it's one of the ways from a practical standpoint, if you had molecular ecology data, you could actually use a program like PopArt to calculate this nucleotide diversity for you, and then you could compare the genetic diversity between different haploid mitochondrial data in different populations, for instance.